Hello, future Aussies. Are you looking for the hottest tips on how to migrate to Australia successfully under the general skilled migration? Previously, we have investigated some of the tips on how the program actually works, what kinds of things you need to look at. But today, I want to help you to know how to conduct your own research to be better informed. So if you aren't tuning into this in the YouTube channel, I would recommend that you pause right here because we're going to be doing just that. Welcome to the 19th episode of Making Australian Migration Easy. I am your host, Rhea Favole. I am the CEO and founder of Solvi Migration, an Australian immigration legal practice. I'm a former Australian immigration official as well. In this episode, I am going to take you into my office to show you a little bit about how you can research each of the different state programs to better understand what you need to look out for in order to get a successful nomination. In the previous episode, we did touch on the General Skilled Migration Program as it stands in this current program year, 2023-24. I also told you that it's a little bit tighter. So with that, I've been fielding a lot more questions from people about, okay, but I still don't understand how I'm supposed to then navigate it. So in today's episode, the first thing we're going to do is talk a little bit about each of the different uh, state and the federal nomination program, but I'm going to show you live how you would do a bit of your own research to understand what you're looking out for on each of the different state websites. Uh, this is something that people may not have thought to do so far. So hopefully that's helpful for you. And then we'll wrap up with a little bit of a summary with the key things that you need to remember before you submit your expression of interest. So please sit back, relax and enjoy. And of course, stay tuned towards the end. We'll be dropping in a bonus for those valued listeners. Okay, everyone. So let's start off. I'll try and work in alphabetical order. The first state that we're going to look at, well, territory is the Australian Capital Territory. So the ACT you need to actually go to the ACT government website. So Australia is actually broken up into jurisdictions, uh, as you would be aware if you've been looking a little bit into the General Skilled Migration Program. So the Australian Capital Territory, a uh, place of, of my birth and where, where I used to live. This is a fantastic town, very well organised. Clearly, it's the capital of, of Australia. The population is smaller, but it has all of the infrastructure and education and so on that you would want to have of any uh, thriving city. So as I had explained in previous episode, the ACT has allocated uh, they've got a total of 1,200 nomination places. So in order to make sure that you're conducting your research to see that you're putting in an expression of interest here where you might be competitive, first of all, you need to go to this website. And this will show you a little bit about uh, the triggers. So for the ACT government on their nomination, what the criteria is for the 491 visa and then for the 190 visa. Uh, you've also got explanations uh, around the doctorate stream, the matrix about where the points can be claimed, which is, of course, tied to the ACT's economy, where the critical skills list is. And it also talks about identifying the occupations that are currently in demand in the ACT. So that's a, a good tip for you to look out for when you're doing your research. So let's start off here, first of all, with looking at the 491 criteria. So it talks a little bit uh, about how to apply. One of the things you need to be mindful of, there is a two-year commitment. So if you're nominated uh, by the ACT to apply for the 491 visa, then you must live and work in Canberra for at least two years from the visa grant. Uh, or that includes if you are moving from overseas, you're from your date of arrival in Canberra. So you need to do a nomination there saying completing it with a score based on the Canberra matrix, so where the points can be claimed against specific criteria. So there's different requirements if you are a resident of Canberra, that's the ACT, or if you are applying from overseas, so outside of Australia. So if you are currently a resident 
of Canberra. So this is basically if you are, are already in Australia, you need you need to look at whether or not you're going to be eligible eligible to nominate for the, these specific state and territory nominations. So if you're in Australia, you need to be someone who is already resident in Canberra. Um, and you'll know that by having a look here. It's saying that you need to be resident in Canberra to have lived there for at least three months at the date of the submission. So you can live within 30 minutes. So for those of you who know uh, the ACT, it is um, it sort of sits inside the state of New South Wales. It's um, The territory is quite small, but that means a lot of people might live on the outskirts of the ACT, so within a 30-minute commuting distance. So areas like Quimbium, Jerobombra and Gogong. Um, you also need to have worked in Canberra for at least 13 weeks, so which is one week more than the, the living requirement. So just to keep those in mind, and, and there's more requirements on what that means to have been employed in the ACT. There, they've got their English requirements as well. So all of these things are, are relevant to check. They do have a service fee for their nomination. So that's a little bit for those who are resident in the ACT. If you are from overseas, then you'd be looking here to see what kind of requirement that they have. Uh, they've got a commitment to Canberra and so on. You'd need to have conducted some research into the ACT labour market to see that you're going to be employable there. Just a reminder to people that you may not be eligible for positions in the Australian government. So that's the federal government because they generally require that you're already an Australian citizen. Um, so even with permanent residency, you're not eligible um, because there's security clearance requirements that require citizenship. So this is a, a good place to start research. Again, there's a $300 nomination fee. 190, which is the uh, permanent visa, uh, there's different requirements depending on whether or not you're resident. Again, similarly though to the uh, 491 requirements, so you do need to have been resident, but you need to have been resident for at least six months, so it's a longer period, and you'll need to have... Uh, proof such as things like your bank statements and transaction history um, showing that you've been residing and, and banking for this period in the ACT. For employment, they're saying that you have lived and worked in Canberra for at least 26 months, so uh, sorry, 26 weeks. So all of these things are important for you to get an understanding to see whether or not you're going to be actually eligible to nominate here. Also for the permanent residents, they have addi additional requirements around English. So you need to have proficient or superior unless you're a chef or you have an ANSCO skill level of three or four. Um, so this will come down to the skill assessments, which of course you all need to have had your skill assessments done before you go to put in an expression of interest. So that's a quick summary of the ACT. There's of course more things to, to research there, uh, but that's a start. Now we'll have a quick look at New South Wales. So you, the New South Wales government, again, you'll notice these different emblems as you're going through because each of them is a separate form of government. We have a federal government, which is for the whole of Australia. These ones are specific to the states and territories. So the New South Wales government, we go to their uh, visas and migration and you'll see that there's information both for the, the 190 and the 491. So we'll start off with the 491 because that is only relevant to regional areas of New South Wales. Um, and then you'll have a little bit of a look at this. So there's different ways of being nominated. So you'll need to understand a bit about that. Uh, the nomination criteria as well that also you are not eligible for New South Wales nomination for the visa if you've previously been nominated by New, New South Wales for any other visa. So there's, there's different things there that you need to just make sure you have checked out depending on the nomination. There's Regional Development Australia office and then there's also alternative ways of being nominated through the state program, which we're expecting will be opened next week. So good to subscribe there as well to keep up to date. Uh, when we're looking at the 190s, which again, these, these invitations, uh, sorry, nomination rounds are not currently happening in New South Wales at the time of recording, they're due to start next week. They've got some general requirements there, but what I think would also be helpful 
to note, and this is why uh, consulting with someone who is in the know about migrating, uh, they will be able to point out things such as the the updates. So when we have a look here, so we've gone back here, and as I suggested, let's go to, um, we want to subscribe there so that you get all of those updates um, about the nominations. So if you'd received those updates, you'd be aware that um, when you look at the news and updates here, we can see that um, as it, the recording that I'm doing, this was two days ago, um, the New South Wales government has published an update because they're about to open their round. These are important that you are subscribed to the updates for each of the, the different uh, states and territories around Australia. So because the rounds, as I've said in previous episodes, run in cycles and there's no guaranteed dates for when those will happen throughout a program year. A program year in Australia um, is in line with our financial years, which is from 1 July through to 30 June each year. So the current program year is active. They hadn't started invitations at the the time of recording this for New South Wales. They have in some other jurisdictions. So it's really important to be aware of that. So New South Wales, different requirements than the ACT. So here they're talking about the fact that they're actually going to be targeting um, specific sectors. So health, education, ICT, infrastructure and agriculture. The focus is going to be on the key sectors, um, but highly ranked expressions of interest submitted in non-priority may be considered. However, due to the exceptionally high standard limited places, they recommend considering other migration options. So that's where it becomes really important to make sure you've done your research and you've had proper migration advice to assess your points because a lot of people are just sort of jumping on the website and kind of guessing that they have a certain number of points. But inevitably, I'm seeing people always um, anticipate that they've got higher points than what they actually do. So something to be aware of. So these are the areas they're going to prioritize when they're talking about exceptionally high. Again, not a lottery, not guaranteed, but we're talking about you having very high point scores um, and very high English and so on in your field to be competitive. So that's a, a quick look at where New South Wales is up to and to, to keep up to date with. Now we look at the Northern Territory. So I jump straight here to look at their particular update. At the time of recording, the Northern Territory has decided um, that they are actually not accepting new nominations just at this time. So you'll need to continue to subscribe to updates and see when that's open again in this program year. And that's because they're going to be looking at those applications that have already been lodged prior to this time um, to assess them against the eligibility criteria. Then if there's other nomination spaces still available, they'll open up another round during this program year. So really important to stay tuned. Um, you know, definitely doesn't mean stop getting things ready. You always need to make sure that you've got your English tests um, up to date, that you've got a skills assessment that is current um, and that you, you're basically ready to roll with your expression of interest in. Now, Queensland, my home state, um, this round is currently open. Um, so you need to go to the Queensland website. Again, useful to subscribe to um, the updates. Queensland has divvied up their um, program for nomination into different areas. So they've got a bit of information about living in Queensland and wages and so on. Um, there are, of course, options for the um, permanent and also the regional, the 491. Uh, I would always encourage people to look at, um, so for example, where I am at the Gold Coast um, is technically regional, other areas such as Sunshine Coast, and there's a lot more that is regional. Um, you may be eligible to nominate for that 491. Now, if you're in an occupation that is not of high demand, it would be worthwhile considering this um, and not just, you know, so many people it's like, well, I just want the 190. Well, that's nice, but you may be missing out on the opportunity. And after only three short years, you're going to be able to apply for permanent residency on the subclass 191 independently. So if you are living in a regional area in Queensland already, um, I'd strongly consider that you nominate for both um, because if you do happen to get that 491, 
um, you still have a provisional visa and you can apply then for permanent residency in only a few short years. Uh, with the 190, um, they uh, you'd want to look at the different criteria. As I said, there's there's criteria for those who are skilled workers already living in Queensland, um, and that includes people who are graduates of Queensland universities. And then there's different requirements around if you are offshore. So when we look at it, they've sort of talked about the the general eligibility for people um, depending on where they live and the offshore Queensland um, skilled occupation list is where you will look to see. Again, we're not talking about regions. It goes according to the postcodes. So just check out where you actually are um, if you're already living in Queensland to see whether or not it meets the definition of regional. Um, if you are outside of Australia and you're just wanting to get your foot in the door to come to Australia and Queensland is one of those, then again, as I said, the 491 can be a good option, particularly when there's such uh, limited numbers of, of nominations. All right, now South Australia, um, they opened a couple of days ago as well, same day as New South Wales. Um, so another wonderful place to, to live in Australia, great wine country for those of uh, you who are interested in that. Um, and they have a focus again on specific occupation areas. So you'll need to make sure you check that out um, and see whether or not you're going to be able to get nominated potentially on that basis. So just continuing here to the nomination options, um, South Australia also has divided the types of, um, like they've sort of grouped separately, those who are South Australian graduates. So if you've been an international student studying uh, in South Australia, uh, you can be eligible for state nomination depending on whether or not you meet their graduate stream requirement. Those who are already working in South Australia, there is a stream. Those who also in other states and territories or offshore, but are highly talented and skilled, there is a stream for you. And if you are offshore, then again, there is another stream there. They have a, you know general information about the kind of supporting information that needs to be uh, available. All of these things, this is where you basically need to check, have a look at the different requirements, have a look at uh, which occupations they will be prioritizing. So as I was saying for other states, it's important that you keep up to date. So let's take a look at the latest news uh, for South Australia uh, now that their nomination process is open. So they've said that they've established it. The registration of interest process uh, needs to be managed because there is strong demand. Uh, and as I said before, it is uh, lower numbers that each jurisdiction has to nominate. So South Australia Australia is going to be prioritising the retention of South Australian international graduates and temporary visa holders. So that means the prioritisation is going to be with uh, migrants who are already in South Australia. Um, they will look at experienced overseas workers in high demand where they have skills such as trades, construction, defence, health, education, natural and physical science, as well as social and welfare professionals. Um, so they're going to be targeted through invitations to apply for South Australian nomination. So just something to be aware of. Um, if you are not in South Australia and you are overseas and you don't fit into these, then it might be worth your while seeking a consultation and seeing if there's other jurisdictions that you might be better placed to migrate or potentially looking at alternative pathways for migration. Okay. Tasmania. So Tasmania has been open for some time, so you'd need to go to the Tasmanian government uh, migration website. Uh, we'll just pop in there. So again, the 491, the 190 visa. We'll pop in here and have a look at the 491. So they have a benchmark of 65 points. And look, this is something that people should watch out for. Again, why I keep saying 491 is a good option for people. Um, it will potentially provide you with an additional 15 points on your calculation that you would have had for a 190 visa, which means that your application is going to be so much more attractive for nomination if you're meeting the requirements. So definitely worthwhile considering um, rather than just opting for jumping straight to the 190 because you might miss out altogether. 
So again, you need to have that commitment to live in Tasmania for at least two years after being granted. And as I've said before, you're eligible to apply for permanent residency as through the subclass 191 after you have lived there for at least three years. So that's what you can do with the 491 visa in all of the jurisdictions. That is very, very helpful. And they've got a list of the eligible occupations that they're looking at here. Um, and that takes you through to the skilled occupation list, which I'll pop into later for all of these generally. All right. Now, that was for the 491 for the subclass 190 visa. They again have similar requirements uh, to what you would have for the 491. But again, as I was saying, because there are such limited numbers, I would encourage people to consider nominating for both. Now, Victoria, um, the Victorian nominations are also open currently, so you can register your expression of interest as well um, through Skill Select. And let's pop into looking at the 491. There are going to be different requirements whether you are onshore or you are offshore. So something to check out and see whether or not you're going to be eligible there. Um, and we can do the same for the 491 as you would do for the 190 visa. And last but not least, uh, Western Australian nomination scheme is currently open as well. They have also announced uh, that they will be targeting certain skills. Let's just click on there. This is how you do a bit of research for yourself. Again, as I was saying, if you are putting an expression of interest for the 491, you are going to get an extra 15 points, whereas you only get five for the 190. So, you know, all, all things that lead to, to better outcomes and, you know, your ultimate goal of becoming permanent in Australia. So they don't have an application fee. It states there. Um, there's different criteria that they've got here. So become familiar with those as well. And there's different, There's a couple of different streams. There's the general stream and the graduate stream as well. Um, so they've got a little table there that explains um, what their different requirements are across those different visas, across um, the different streams. Okay, now where you need to go to actually check that your occupation is on a list. So people tend to look at the... The 189, which is the federal nominated program, that also isn't currently open. Um, it tends to historically have less occupation codes. Um, it's really quite targeted in what they will have. But who knows what will happen with this program year because they did uh, slash a lot of the nominations available for the states and territories. Um, so take a quick look there. So that's that 189, which of course is uh, permanent residency, uh, attractive to some. Uh, it is important though when you're putting in a nomination to note that some uh, jurisdictions will, will disqualify you if you um, put that you nominate for this uh, subclass 189 and for the 190 and 491 that you need to pick one or the other and you can only pick one jurisdiction. So just be aware of that when you're preparing your expressions of interest. And that, again, will take you to the skilled occupation list. All right, scrolling down. So what we actually want to do is see whether or not your particular occupation code that you have had your skills positively assessed for appears on the particular visa subclass that you want. So let's say you are a registered nurse, um, you would have had your skills assessed and there's a number of different occupation codes, but let's say it was for a registered nurse, aged care, that would be the ANSCO code that you would have had a positive skills assessment from the Australian Nursing and Midwifery Accreditation Council. And we can see they are going to be eligible for the 189, for the 190, and also for the 491. So this is what you need to do to see whether or not your occupation is going to be eligible for those different visas. As trained uh, professionals, uh, so for your uh, immigration lawyers and migration agents, we have different tools that we can use to research, um, but they're only available to professionals, so a little bit more detailed than this. 
when we are then looking for where you actually make those expressions of interest, you go to Skill Select on the Department of Home Affairs website. Um, this is where you can start your expression of interest. So that's a little bit of a summary for how you can conduct your own research to start to become familiar with which programs uh, might be the best way forward uh, for you to uh, express, express an interest and ultimately gain a nomination um, either for the subclass 491, the 190 or the 189 visa. It still always pays to get that professional advice because as you can see, there is so much to take into consideration. Um, and when it comes to assessing points, this is what I say people make a lot of mistakes in. They don't realize. So when we as migration professionals are doing the, that research, we are using additional tools. I'll give you a quick sneak peek into that now. All right, everyone. So Trade Secrets, this is a subscription that only professionals can have access to. This is called Legend.com. This is what the visa decision makers in the department who are ultimately going to decide on whether or not your visa application is worth granting. These are the tools that they use to assess and these are the tools that myself and my colleagues who are immigration lawyers or registered migration agents use in order to actually do proper research on whether or not you're eligible for something and how to present and prepare your case to meet the requirements. So there is an absolute bundle of information here that uh, is not uh, you know, readily available to the public that you may miss. So for example, when you're talking about assessing your points, this is what we will be doing. We'll be looking at Schedule 6. Schedule 6, we can have a look here at the English language qualification. So, you know, common mistake that I'll see people make. I'm from an English speaking country, therefore I believe I get 20 points. Well, let's have a look there and see what the actual requirements. So when we click on that, it takes us to a definition. It says superior English has been given meaning by this particular regulation. This person, a person has superior English if they undertook a language test. It doesn't say just because you happen to be someone who has been educated in English or from an English speaking country. So these are the types of things when you're paying for professional advice that we are checking. So when people are just looking at a website and doing drop down lists and guessing what they believe they're attributing points, these are the kinds of things where I see the mistakes being made. So that gives you a little bit of context when we talk about um, assessing points and how people kind of make mistakes. The next thing is the PAMs. These are the policy instructions. These are the things that decision makers rely on. This explains to them how they are to interpret the, the legislation and then the regulations and the legislative instruments in order to make a decision. So it goes right down into, um, you know, initial estimates are not assessed scores. So the assessed score is the total applicant was given there. So against, as I was saying before, Schedule 6D. So this is why I just wanted to give you all a little bit of um, insider uh, knowledge to understand when people are sort of saying, but I can just figure it out myself. Why going to a professional pays? Because this is where the mistakes can be made. And as we know, visa application charges are not refundable. Um, you, you can't just go and um, sort of say, oh, but I want to, to do it again. You'll need to submit all over again. And when we're talking about this particular process, if you got your points wrong at the point of putting in your expression of interest, then you can forget about it. The, the nomination wasn't valid in the first place. Other things that can come unstuck down the track, if there was a mistake made and you've claimed something that wasn't true, when they come to do things like uh, review your permanent residency for citizenship and so on, they may find that there was mistakes and you were never actually entitled because it was not done properly. You didn't have the correct test scores at that particular time. Therefore, revocation um, and cancellation of your, your visa. So um, 
really important. I, I can't stress that enough why it does pay to actually get a professional to take a look at your case because it is a really important decision. And a lot of people it's like, well, I, I want to save the cost. Well, what's the cost in terms of successful migration or not and you know trying to do your visa application all over again for the cost of a consultation to to check things over or to make sure a professional has taken it from start to finish for you always worthwhile but hopefully the information that I've given you today means that you will be in the know and understand um, what you need to look out for even if you're going to a professional to say look this is what I've researched so far can you please confirm this um, or, you know, they might be able to give you further guidance as to what's happening because it is an ever-evolving movement of things when it comes to the nomination processes. Thank you so much, everyone. So in today's episode, we pivoted a little to look at how we actually conduct research into the nominated program for general skilled migration. And just to understand how you can do that state by state around Australia. We dove into each of the different states and territories and also touched on the federal program as well. And then we wrapped up with a bit of, you know, the, the top tips that you need to remember before you submit that expression of interest. And of course, as a bonus for our valued listeners, what we're going to do is we've had a bit of a system change. So we're going to be popping a link in the notes for you to click on and to book your consultation with a discount. This is only for our valued listeners. So please do have a look at this and I encourage you to uh, like, subscribe and share if you're finding that you're getting value out of this show. We really appreciate all of your feedback and we look forward to working with you and welcoming you to Australia as new migrants. 